You're watching Tag TV. You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show with Afghanistan where the political situation has become more complex and intriguing after the presidential elections. While on one side both the frontrunners Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah have claimed victory, the Taliban on the other side have sought Islamabad backing for the resumption of peace talks that were cancelled last month by US President Donald Trump. A report. <music> Deferred choice. The presidential elections in Afghanistan finally materialized on 28 September with an unexpectedly low turnout. Only a fifth of the 9.6 million people who had registered themselves for the voting turned up to cast their ballot. In the previous presidential election, around 60% of them had exercised their voting rights. However, an upped offensive compounded by an open Taliban threat to civilians restrained people from coming to polling stations this time. A certain phenomenon, however, is seemingly repeating itself as both the camps of Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah are claiming victory. The claims and counterclaims echo an election crisis five years ago when competing claims by the two men led to months of turmoil. در وضعیت موجود انتخابات به دور دوم نمیره و تیم ثبات و امگرایی حکومت آینده را تشکیل میتنیم شد. بعضی از مقامات حکومتی مستقیم متاسفانه در ولایت کشور در کار انتخابات دخالت کردند که برخورد قانونی به امرایشان صورت خواهد گرفت. Afghan presidential candidates have a pattern of assembling competing coalitions of regional and ethnic chieftains and accusing rival camps of organizing fraud in far-flung districts under the control of their supporters. Abdullah was also involved in a month-long election dispute in 2009 when he challenged the victory of the then incumbent Hamid Karzai. People are unable to take decisions in such chaotic situations as there are no credible exit polls in the country which can drive voters towards a rational and clear frame of mind. ارقام را که ما در اختیارم دارم ام دفعه پیروزی ما ارقام نمیگم به خاطر که یک سوی تعبیر نشه پیروزی ما سیلاب گونه خواد بود لند سلایت می باشه از ما خروجی چی می باشه او را ما باید منتظر بانیم و به حکم کمیسون لبایک بگوییم احترام بگوییم ملت افغانستان مخشوش نسازیم قضاوت نمیتونه خیابانی باشه قضاوت باید انستیتوشنل و نهادینه باید باشه و ما به این قضاوت نهادینه و انستیتوشنل حرمت خود گذاشته The Independent Election Commission of Afghanistan has condemned and warned both the candidates of not making such announcements before 19th October when the preliminary results of the elections are expected. Meanwhile, something strange is transpiring in Pakistani corridors where both the Taliban leadership and the US representative Zalmay Khalilzad have held talks with the top leadership. These developments, which are a sign of an attempt being made to resume the collapsed peace talks 
are in clear contradiction with the position held by US President. Moreover, they have also sent a complicated signal to all those who were hailing US for sidelining the insurgent groups. However, Kabul's stand is resolute and consistent. Earlier during the 74th session of UNGA in New York, it had asked insurgents to tow their line. To the Taliban and their foreign sponsors, hear this now, a message from the Afghan people. Join us in peace or we will continue to fight. As my colleague Ambassador Adil Araz said last week here at the United Nations, this is a fight we can, can win. Afghanistan has for years accused Islamabad of supporting terrorist groups that have been fomenting violence in the country. Kabul has also termed Taliban as stooges of Islamabad who are killing people at the behest of Pakistani generals. The situation which has developed of late has also suggested the close proximity Taliban and Pakistani establishment enjoy with each other. Now it remains to be seen how Islamabad, which itself stands on the cusp of being blacklisted this month by the Financial Action Task Force, navigates the situation and what script it comes ahead with for the world. Pakistan and fear seem to have become synonyms of each other. While its Prime Minister threatens the world by saying he'll take up arms, his followers are on a rampage against minorities. Christians, Sikhs and Hindus are systematically being targeted across the length and breadth of the country. And the principal tool being employed for the persecution is blasphemy law. From Christian Asya Bibi to Hindu professor, a lot of them have been targeted in the name of religious law. The country, which has received a lot of flack for carrying out terrorist attacks, is now backing fundamentalists to kill its own people. A report. The Israeli architecture was a Hindu temple. Scores of such buildings belonging to minorities have been demolished lately by an unyielding and rapidly growing Islamic mob in Pakistan. Sindh, where the predominant minority is Hindu, has witnessed a cruel and intensifying wave of violence where the minorities have been attacked by radicalized youth. A politics-driven agenda fueled by influential religious leaders has pushed minorities of Pakistan towards a constant shadow of fear. Recently, an indoctrinated adolescent accused an honorable professor of blasphemy and riots broke out. Anti-minority vandalism engulfed the region of Sindh. This is a systematic design. Number one, they have sprayed and spent so much on religious radicalization. And secondly, I'll tell you a couple of more things. That Sindh produces 73-74% of gas at Pakistan. And the largest gas uh, fields are in that Gotki. So Gotki, in fact, produces roughly 27-28% uh, of the whole of the gas. So it's very, very important. Secondly, there is a very large uh, Sindhi Hindu community in that area, in Gotki, in Mirpur Mathelo, in Obavado, in this area. And as it has been happening for last many years, they want to create a situation of fear and reprisal and so coerce them to leave. And this is part of that. The mob vandalized three temples and damaged a school and houses belonging to the Hindu community in Kotki. Local Hindu community since then has been fearing more aggression from Islamist mobs in a country 
where outrage sentiments have resulted in entire localities belonging to religious minorities being raised. While Christian communities are largely targeted in Punjab owing to demographic distribution, local Hindus are often attacked in Sindh, where they are more densely populated. They have created so much radicalization that people, and they have got their own proxies that they can mobilize. And so it's really a very sad situation. As a result, a lot of damage happened. The uh, places of worship were attacked. Their properties were attacked. Their uh, businesses were attacked. It is a systematic design of Islamabad where the minorities are targeted at the instructions of political and military masters. The drive against the minorities began a long time ago in the decades of 70s and 80s when minorities who formed a significant part of the country's population were subjected to an unannounced ethnic cleansing. Such is a situation today that people who contribute a double-digit percentage are struggling for their existence. In the past few decades, things have become worse for the minorities in Pakistan, the foremost reason being the radicalization of Pakistani society and government's apathy towards them. And if the situation persists even at the pace with which it is moving today, then the day is not far when Pakistan will be graveyard for the minorities. To speak more on the issue, we are now joined by Rubina Greenwood, the chairperson of World Sindhi Congress. So, Ms. Rubina, how do you analyze the current human rights situation in Sindh province and how, according to you, Pakistan has been treating the province as a whole? Uh, it's a very uh, grave situation at the moment and especially the recent uh, move by PTI government on uh, Karachi issue, which is the soul of Sindh. Um, it's been... Uh, uh, using a constitutionally very illegally to take the uh, Karachi into the federal uh, in, uh, in charge to the federal government. The situation is that they are using the wrong application of the constitution um, and um, it's um, Karachi is the soul and survival of Sindh. At no cost Sindhis will actually give up um, on the Karachi. Not only that issue, the other issue is the land grabbing is a, one of the major issues going on in Karachi and outskirts of the Karachi and many parts of the Sindh, where they are selling the um, Sindh land to the uh, builders and the uh, large uh, construction companies on a very minimal cost and the benefit and the, 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 um, the charge for this land has been given to the um, federal government, not actually the people of Sindh. So there is a, a systematic situation going on. Is one hand is a land grabbing issues uh, of sin, and other hand to taking the uh, soul of Karachi uh, in, into the federal custody. Taking the human rights issue side of it, still we have um, every single day we have a kidnapping, enforced disappearances, uh, an extrajudicial killing, and um, you must have heard recently last week about one of the famous professor was taken away. Um, obviously, there was a social media and there was a lot of cry on it. They had to release him, but you could see that how the, even uh, any uh, liberal or secular person who can talk about the rightful things could be taken away by the government and the agencies in Pakistan. Um, in terms of poverty, still Sindhi people lives below 50% poverty line, considering we are the richest state in, the, in, um, in, in Pakistan. Issues of the women, enforced disappearance and forced marriages continue. Still we have 10 to 12 girls every month are kidnapped. Um, situation of Sindhi Hindus is very grave in, in Pakistan, in particularly Sindh, but it, again it's a political driven. Um, we do not see any uh, solution to the, whether whichever government is, whether it's a PTI government or Muslim League or People's Party. Moving on, the ties between two largest economies of South Asia, India and Bangladesh are constantly moving north. The diplomacy and economy has further been boosted by the regular visits of state heads. Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina came to India on a four-day visit to provide an impetus to the ties. She expressed her government's willingness to open more market and space for Indian industrialists. Both the countries are amongst the fastest growing countries in the world and they are now playing instrumental role in each other's growth. A report.
Sheikh Hasina is on a four-day visit to India to further bolster the ties between two countries that have flourished in last few years. Hasina, who believes that diplomatic ties have now been replaced by economic ties, inaugurated the India-Bangladesh Business Forum at New Delhi and stated that together both countries will take the bilateral ties to new heights. She urged Indian investors to step up their investment in Bangladesh, saying her country knows how to transform challenges into opportunities. Bangladesh has offered three special economic zones for India investors at Mongla, Bharamara and Mireshwai. Two of them already we signed agreement and third one will be signed very soon. This is Hasina's first visit to India after both the countries went to polls and same leaders returned to power with a thumping majority. Noting that most of the growing economies in the world have undertaken their primary trade and investment projects in their neighboring countries, she said in a similar manner, Indian business leaders could play a very big role in furthering Bangladesh's economic prospects. We also want to see trade and investment together where Indian big investors can set up industries in Bangladesh and export the products to the northeastern states of India and to the Southeast Asian countries taking advantage of the improved connectivity between us. Bangladesh, erstwhile East Pakistan, is also one of India's largest trade partner in South Asia, with bilateral trade amounting to around 9.3 billion US dollars in 2017 to 2018. The two sides are expected to sign almost a dozen agreements to bolster ties and would also hold discussions on the sensitive river water sharing issue, as well as the Rohingya refugees during the visit. The significance of strong India-Bangladesh ties goes beyond the bilateral context. Good relations between India and Bangladesh are bound to have a positive influence on the region. Regional countries like Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar and Thailand will benefit from trade and transit connectivity between India and Bangladesh. Moving on to illegally occupied region of Gilgit Baltistan where the people are deprived of the fundamental rights and essential needs. It's not just their land and resources which have been plundered by Pakistan but also the jobs and the right of employment. Whether it is a clerk, clergy or attorney, all the positions are occupied by people sent from Islamabad and not the locals who have a prerogative over such offices. Pleas and litigations by the locals have not been able to buzz authorities from their stance. Islamabad's strategy has been quite simple and clear. Exploit the region with all the might and suppress the dissent with brute high-handedness. A report. This conference is being organized by Awami Action Committee of Kilgit Baltistan to express its anger against Pakistan's establishment and demand fair share of jobs for the local residents who have been discriminated and denied employment from almost every department of Gilgit, Baltistan. They also accuse the local administration, which in reality works at the instructions of Islamabad, of involving in unscrupulous practices in order to keep the locals away from the jobs. इस गिलगित बल्तिस्तान के अंदर बहुत सारे इदारों में बहुत सारे गैर डोमिसाइल होल्डर बहुत सारे मुलाजिमिन ऐसे मौजूद हैं जिनका आना भी ज्यादती है जो इस पावर शेयरिंग फार्मूले की भी खिलाफ वर्जी करते हुए आए हैं लेकिन उसके बावजूद भी हमने कभी जवाब नहीं खोली और सितम बाला है सितम ये कि ऐसे लोगों को जहां अपॉइंट की गई कि जिनका अगर एजुकेशन देखा जाए जिनका करेक्टर देखा जाए तो मैं नहीं समझता कि उनको कलरक भी अपॉइंट किया जा सके दिस डिस्क्रिमिनेटरी सिस्टम हैज बीन इन प्लेस सिंस द रीजन वाज इलीगली ऑक्युपाइड सून आफ्टर द फॉर्मेशन ऑफ इस्लामिक पाकिस्तान द सिविल एंड द मिलिट्री लीडरशिप have worked in coherence to give more damage to the people of Gilgit-Baltistan. 
the region had enough resources to sustain and flourish on itself. But Pakistan exploited everything for its own benefits. In line of a satanic and suppressive strategy, Islamabad didn't allow people to attain higher education and a limited few who managed to attain it, despite all the odds, were barred from entering the government departments through one trick or another. The chances of a resident of Kilgit, Baltistan getting a government job are negligible and if anybody manages to get a low-level job, then he is never promoted. तो इसके बेंच में इसके साथ उसी साल में सत्रह सिकेल में अपॉइंटमेंट हुए आज भी सत्रह में मौजूद हैं उनके लिए लोकल के लिए तरक्की के दरवाजे बंद और जो फेडरल से आया हो जो गैर डोमिसाइल होल्डर हो उसको जो भी यहां पे चीफ जस्टिस आया जो भी यहां पे सेक्रेटरी आया उसने उसको इतना ऊपर मोड किया कि वो खुद को फिर महसूस करता रहा और लोकल मुलाजमीन के इस्तेसाल से भी वो ग्रेज नहीं करता रहा एक ये सूरत हाल जी बी एम्प्लॉयज आर एक्सप्लॉयटेड बाई द बॉसिस हु हैव बीन इंस्टॉल्ड बाई इस्लामाबाद दे आर मेड टू डू वर्क विच इज अगेंस्ट देर जॉब प्रोफाइल एज वेल एज द स्टीम दे केन नॉट से नो टू एनी वर्क एज दे रन द रिस्क ऑफ बींग सेक्ट फ्रॉम द जॉब इन डूइंग सो द कॉमन पीपल ऑफ द रीजन आर फ्रस्ट्रेटेड विद पाकिस्तानी एटीट्यूड दे हैव नो ऑप्शन but to hold demonstrations against the government today anti pakistan conferences in illegally occupied gilgit baltistan have become a regular phenomenon however the reaction to such events has also been same more apathy and more discrimination Moving on to Nepal's capital Kathmandu that recently hosted a khadi fashion show to mark the 150th birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi Ensembling khadi and handloom couture from India and Nepal the show was perfect mixture of glamour beauty and tradition have a look Donned in traditional khadi outfit models walked the ramp of khadi fashion show that was organized by the embassy of india in association with south asia foundation in kathmandu showcasing the creative use of the fabric which was popularized by gandhi during the freedom movement many renowned fashion designers from india and nepal including the ace designer muzaffar ali and his wife meera ali presented their latest creations at the fashion show The current ambassador of India to Nepal, Manjeev Singh Puri, graced the event and highlighted the values and wisdom of Mahatma Gandhi before the audience. Today, we're able to showcase this, the great legacy of Gandhi here in Nepal. Mr. Muzaffar Ali, Meera Ji, Charu Parashar, Lisa Verma, and all the other fantastic designers from India, Sabha Nepal, Tara Bhuiya, all of them were here. They are going to present something which is absolutely scintillating. I am sure most of you have seen them in magazines, maybe in some big top shows somewhere. But today they have joined us, and we are very grateful to them. The event was attended by a number of former ministers, ambassadors, high-level officials, and people from different walks of life. It was a great initiative by both the countries to bring Mahatma Gandhi's favorite fabric in the fashion limelight that too on the occasion of his 150th birth anniversary. <laughs> Nepal and India have for long maintained warm relationship. Both the countries not only share an open border and unhindered movement of people, but they also have close bonds through marriages and family ties. Hosting such events will help to encourage hand-spun khadi both in India and Nepal as a fashion statement. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.